Yeah, hello and good afternoon. Welcome to our lecture series on climate protection. There is only one lecture left um, and today um, we will um, hear a presentation from Simon Beck. Um, my colleague Simon Beck uh, completed his master degree in uh, environmental engineering end of 2020. His master thesis dealt with the optimization of predictive control systems using flexibilities in building technology with renewable energy supply. Since then, he was working in the energy efficient building department um, in the sparkling science project DigiDat. Um, that's a project for digital analysis of indoor air quality in school buildings using uh, citizen science methods. But today, uh, the topic is about the Tyrolean capacities for an energy transition in the buildings sector. This was initiated by Professor Wolfgang Streicher and it aims to develop an accurate database and a better understanding of the need for products and services for the regional energy transition and of Tyrol's capacities in the building sector. Uh, for those of you who uh, are interested in the uh, concept Tyrol 2050 scenarios of a carbon free energy future, you can watch the recording on the YouTube channel. You know, we have uh, all the recordings stored on the uh, YouTube channel. Um, you find the link here on the slide and in the link list in OLAD, you find a lot of uh, other interesting links there. And just click on that and then you can watch um, the video um, about um, this study from uh, Wolfgang Streicher. But now we will hear in the presentation from Simon what is necessary to put uh, this into practice. I'm looking forward to hearing from his presentation what we can learn from the results of this study. So welcome, Simon. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope uh, anyone also online can hear me. Uh, thanks, Raina, for the introduction. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm now going to tell you about, in the next hour, about the Tyrolean capacities for the energy transition. Um, this is part of the Tyrol 2050 initiative or project, and we're focusing today on buildings. So what is needed to, to reach the goals uh, when we concern only buildings. So the goal of this project or study was uh, to uh, find out the number of components required to achieve the Tyrol 2050 targets and um, also find out the capacities of the Tyrolean companies. So uh, what can they currently produce? What are they planning to produce in the future? Um, and then identify if there are gaps between what is needed and what is given. Um, and also identify limiting factors. So often it is not just a pure number of, for example, uh, number X of heat pumps is necessary. And so we manufacture that. We also need, for example, the personnel or the money to do that or other stuff. But I'm coming to that later. And then in the end, uh, we want to find possible measures to close these capacity gaps. You will uh, get the gist of it uh, when, when I progress with the slides. Um, the word capacity is, in this sense, maybe a bit uh, yeah, confusing. The project process just to see uh, how this all came together. In the, on the first step, we determined the number of units from the building data we had from other previous studies uh, from Tyrol 2050. Um, and we also did some researching on the personnel situation. How many people are there who can install uh, heat pumps, for example, or uh, how many people can do wall insulation. Then you also have to invite uh, the stakeholders, authorities, schools, uh, principals, for example, or companies, and they can tell you what their plans are for the future. 
And what is very important here, we're always teaching the status quo, uh, especially in the high schools, you learn what is done now. But when you're done with high school and maybe do your studies or something else, and when you work, the things you learned is already old. Okay, so this is a major problem here we, we have to face um, because technology is, is evolving so rapidly that you would have to learn already the things that are going to be there in the future. Yeah, and also some workshops to identify possible measures. So how can we solve the problems we uh, found out here? Quick recap. Uh, if you watch uh, the slides, uh, what uh, uh, Rainer said before uh, from Wolfgang Streicher, you can see in detail how this comes together. So this is the final energy demand in the building sector, including also industrial buildings. Um, we see here this trend from 2015. That was when the study originally started and the end would be 2050. So this does not fit completely to the now the, the most recent uh, Austrian goal where we want to reach climate neutrality in 2040. Um, but this was the old goal, so to say. Uh, here we can see the different energy carriers for uh, that we need to heat the building, to heat the warm water, to have uh, household electricity. And in the beginning, we see lots of oil and gas still. Uh, coal is almost uh, not there anymore. There are some houses, but you couldn't see that on this graph. Uh, then we have district heating, which is already established in Tyrol. Pretty good. I hope. Does <laughs> sound come from? Okay. Hope it works. Uh, then we have the district heating, already established, and also a big part is biomass. So wood chips, pellets, and uh, log firing, for example. And then this uh, big red part, uh, which is electricity. And you see, someone has, uh, please, can you mute? Um, David, could you please mute your mic? Thank you. Yes. Don't want to take part in the. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll continue. Um, and then you see in the beginning, this orange part is almost given a bit of the yellow. This is solar thermal. The orange part would be the energy from the environment, the energy you you get when you work with heat pumps, for example. So in the end, uh, we want to reduce our final energy demand for the buildings uh, uh, with 31.4%. Uh, and uh, the final energy demand without this environmental energy or solar energy of 54.9%. Yes, then uh, we continue. Oop. So let's look at the historical development. What happened in the past? Uh, maybe try to figure out what happened there and then try to take that uh, into the future. So the renovation rate in the past was around one to maybe 2% was the maximum. Um, we saw there uh, a small rise, but it's already coming down again. And uh, in, in the studies in Tyrol 2050, we were always calculating with 1.4%, which is about uh, the, the value in year 2018. So uh, there is some room for improvement. Uh, I think 
in, in Austria, they aim for a 3% renovation rate. I'm not sure if that's still uh, recent data. And in blue, you see there the total renovation, uh, total renovations, and in orange, you see single measures. And when you combine two or three single measures, you get an equivalent total renovation. So that's the reason why we can add that just, uh, we can add that up. So in the end, in 2018, 1.4% of all the area where we live in the buildings uh, was renovated. This here is for residential buildings only. Then look at the final energy demand. Uh, here we can see a small decline in the demand for oil, uh, a rise in the demand for gas, natural gas, and a small rise in uh, environmental energy. So that would be the representative for the heat pumps. Uh, district heating has like this step there. This is probably the change of how we do the accounting with the energy. Um, but altogether, you see the trend with gas is still going up to the year 2021. That does not fit our goals in Tyrol 2050. So that's possibly uh, something, or that's, that is something we have to improve to reach our climate neutrality in Tyrol. Then look at heat pumps. Um, I don't know if you're all too familiar with heat pumps. Uh, they're really gaining attraction uh, and uh, in the last few years. So uh, here we can see in 2006, there were only a few heat pumps installed and mostly ground source for groundwater heat pumps. And uh, nowadays, um, mostly, yeah, probably if almost all of the heat pumps installed are air to water heat pumps. So this would be this blue bar that you can see, which is getting bigger and bigger. So that is, that is the top, total number of heat pumps installed in Tyrol. Uh, and this, you can see in the end, only the blue, uh, the blue part is rising in the end. And in the year 2021, we had about 5,300 heat pumps installed in Tyrol. And that number is important because uh, uh, maybe we can remind that later uh, when we compare it to the heat pumps we need in the future. Here we can see the shares of the different heat pumps, heat pump types. So as I said before, air to water heat pumps, the blue part, is really taking up the whole market right now. This is probably because um, they're easy to install or quicker to install than the other types. And also you have a lower like uh, hurdles, regulatory hurdles, bureaucratic hurdles to install an air to water heat pump than the other types. Then let's look at solar and district heating. Solar thermal, the golden times of solar thermal are over since around 2006. <laughs> so a declining uh, uh, graph here. From year to year, uh, less installations and also the total um, number of uh, installed collector area is now going down since a few years. Um, this is not including PV, just solar thermal. So uh, when we look at PV later, this is a totally different picture. And also district heating, uh, this is very difficult to grasp, but here uh, the district heating in and around Innsbruck is uh, displayed. And maybe this is representative for district heating in general, um, because uh, it is rising from year to year. So even uh, um, like almost a linear growth of new customers, new district heating connections we can see here.
And the last heating system we want to talk about now with the historical data is the wood-fired heating. As I said, there is uh, different types, also hybrid uh, firing systems. Um, maybe you're familiar with wood chips or pellet heating, and uh, we can see the rise of those wood-fired heating systems in the last uh, 20 years. And then we take all this historical data, we take the data from the previous studies, and we try to calculate what all those energy numbers, the terajoules and megawatts and, and so on, means in numbers of heat pumps to be installed, of uh, numbers of PV panels to be installed, numbers of uh, people we need for that. And so we're building up on the forecasts which happened in the previous study. And uh, just as a disclaimer, we're talking here about orders of magnitude. So uh, if you're doing such calculations, you're always working with averages, average standard type buildings. And uh, so for that reason, only take the orders of magnitude, not the exact values. So the necessary heating systems. Here we see the, the yearly installed heating systems. The most left bar would be the old data from 2022. We can see pretty evenly spread out between heat pumps, 1,650 heat pumps installed in this year, then a few less with district heating and this um, brownish area here, uh, the, the three, the three uh, parts, like the brown and the pink and this orange one in the middle are the wood firing heating systems. And in 2022, we still have gas and oil heating systems installed. And this is in uh, newly installed. So not what is given from the history. So really newly installed people today are really building new oil heating systems for whatever reason. Uh, so altogether, uh, we have these three periods, uh, which you see the right three bars, which are the periods to 2030, 2040, and 2050. And the values that you see are for each year in this period. So, just imagine for the next seven years, we have to install 4,000 heat pumps per year to reach the goals we set ourselves. Altogether, there are about 235,000 new heating systems to be installed. Uh, we have uh, over 100,000 heat pumps. So that's quite a large number. If we remember, if we go back again uh, to the heat pumps, let's see. Uh, we now have 5,000 heat pumps installed around, maybe a bit more in 2022 and 2023, but now we're talking about over 100,000. Okay. Then we're going to the residential buildings, just to see a bit, this is the same graph, for, but before we had all buildings, now we have just residential buildings. Here we have uh, a big part heat pumps and also a big part um, biomass firing systems and a small part of district heating. And on the top there, you can see this uh, small line with solar thermal. And uh, this makes up most of the new heating installations, but uh, maybe if we look at the next slide, you can see we have different heating loads. I hope everyone in here is familiar with heating load. Uh, this would be the power you need to heat your home at the coldest day. So broadly said. <clears throat> And uh, the smaller or the better insulated your house is, the smaller power output your heating system must generate. 
And so we see that uh, especially the very small power output heating systems, when you look uh, when you talk about heat pumps, are necessary in the future. And this does not comply with the current market. Nowadays, most of the heat pump systems are uh, have a power output of greater than five kilowatt peaks. Yes, then look at biomass. So this was all heat pumps, now biomass. Here we see that we have also a few larger uh, power output categories. Um, this is uh, because of a different system with heat pumps. It, uh, the, the smaller power outputs are easier to achieve. Higher outputs are harder to achieve. And so biomass in this case is more suitable for that. So that's the reason why we have uh, also the uh, higher power output here with biomass. And the last step would be district heating. Again, the same picture as with biomass, larger heating heat loads of the building. Uh, and we want to install those buildings, uh, district heating connections. Then again, the same thing for non-residential buildings. So this would be hotels, industry buildings, or uh, like, yes, all sorts of where people do not live. And we can see that here we, uh, in the forecasts, we have around a thousand new heating systems inst uh, installed each year. And most of them are heat pumps again, and district heating. So just in numbers, we need till 2050 over 30,000 new heating systems just for the non-residential buildings. Then again, power output as uh, same picture as before, but here with the non-residential buildings, since they're always uh, bigger and have a higher heat load. Um, the, uh, the heating system you have to ins install are also bigger. So in this case, uh, the power output of the heating systems are uh, in this analysis going up to over 200 kilowatts. And here we have this problem. There are certainly buildings with a higher uh, heat load. But when you take average buildings, you kind of uh, lose those outliers a bit. Okay, so for this reason, just orders of magnitude, we see the trend that we have here, uh, higher power output, as you could think with non-residential buildings. Also the same here with uh, district heating, um, mainly the bigger power output heating systems. Okay, what are the findings uh, when we talk about the heating system? The manufacturers see no bottleneck in production. Uh, we've seen before we need a, around 4,500 in the like worst case year uh, to reach our goals. And the plant production in Tyrol already 2025, I think that was the number is 55,000 heat pumps uh, that the manufacturers want to produce in Tyrol. This does not mean that all of those heat pumps are sold in Tyrol. Probably uh, most of them are exported or uh, installed in some other area in Austria. Uh, but we can see we, it would be possible to self-sustain our heat pump market. What we also found out that we uh, need heat pumps with smaller power ratings. And some manufacturers at least told us or currently work on those uh, smaller heat pumps and mainly air to water heat pumps. So in the stakeholder workshops with the manufacturers, we also uh, took a close look on, on what, what's the need uh, in the industry, they say we need more planners and more craftsmen, more planners to 
find the right heating system for the building and more craftsmen to install those heating systems. Then they have a desire for fewer bureaucratic hurdles. Uh, that's, I think, a general problem uh, in this topic. And uh, we had some difficult years with the supply chain after Corona and uh, where this, where this uh, ship got stuck. Uh, you can remember maybe, uh, but the supply chain, as they said, is working again. So they can really take action now and the numbers uh, match that. Then we talk about uh, personnel. How many people do we need just for the heat pump installations? Uh, as the heat pumps were the biggest part, uh, we're just focusing on that. Um, for the planning of a heat pump systems, you need one to three people. And for the installation, two to five people. That's uh, the information we got from uh, contractors. Um, I mean, it depends on the heating load of the building, but that's like a rule of thumb. So when we calculate it and we assume that this HVAC specialist only installs heat pumps all day long, all year long, um, we need about 35 planners who only do heat pumps and 600 installers or workers that install the heat pumps. Um, we're going to match that later with what we have, but maybe let's continue, continue with the renovations. What is needed here? We can see here again the overview of the renovations we had, an approximation of the renovations we had in 2022. So about, I mean, I guess 2,800 renovations per year. And uh, since we have the renovation rate constant for this project, it stays the same. So for this case, for the next uh, 27, 26 years, we should have around 3,000 renovations per year. Uh, altogether, 85,000 buildings that need some sort of improvement. Um, some sort of improvement means we need a high quality renovation. So we need a ventilation system with heat recovery. We need highly efficient windows. We need thick insulation layers on the walls and the roof. And what that means in numbers, here the area, insulated wall area we need in the future is uh, 47 million square meter. We somehow have to insulate and that's 4,000 square meter per, per day. So just think about uh, that number. Every day we have a huge area to insulate. And when you walk around, you don't see that too often that the houses uh, get insulation. So you really have to uh, look at that. <clears throat> then windows, necessary windows. Again, we're replacing the old window uh, windows with highly efficient windows. And there we need about 400, 400 windows per day to be replaced or newly installed. Like the different colors in this graph uh, are always for the different building types. And in this case, you see uh, the single family homes need in general, although they are the biggest part of the building, uh, uh, like uh, the building sector, they need less windows than the small multifamily home. This is again, because we are dealing with average building types. And also if you look at uh, very big buildings, uh, they pretty much all of them have lots of windows right next to each other. So that's the reason why, uh, I mean, for example, uh, what's, what's a good thing here to, to see? Sorry, uh, we need for the industry buildings, 
still a big chunk of new windows, although there are probably not that many industry buildings in Tyrol currently. Okay, what are the findings with the renovations? Uh, the renovation rate is assumed to be unchanged from the past years. And we want to improve the renovation depth. So the quality of our renovation should be better than in the past. And they must be higher to reach our own set goals. So that's really important. And this does currently not match the regulatories we have. And probably a few more people are needed for this better, higher quality renovation. Um, the problem could be to instruct the employees, workers, uh, to really make sure that these better standards are sufficiently uh, built also in the real world. So on the one hand, you have to plan a highly efficient building. On the other hand, you have to do it correctly on the site. Then very exciting topic, the PV. In the Tyrol scenarios, we always uh, look at roof PV. This has some political reasons. Uh, political parties had also influence uh, on the previous work. So, um, it is hard to argue uh, why we should plant the PV all over our nice landscape. So they decided, although it's maybe not the best uh, way to go, to put PV only on roofs. And we see here the historical data of PV installations. Again, the trend is uh, when we look at this black line, it looks like an exponential start. Um, we have currently around 225 megawatt peaks uh, installed. That's around, I think, 20,000 PV systems on our roofs. But our set goal that we want to reach is 3,900 megawatt peaks. You see that in the right upper corner. So that's, I'm not sure, about 10 to 15 X of what we have right now. And although we're doing quite good in the past years, uh, we need to improve that even more. Here we can see the power outputs of the like single PV systems. And we see that the trend uh, is now going towards uh, PV systems with higher power output. This is also because the, the regulations are now uh, different than in the past. And there is uh, the way is free to go with higher, uh, higher power systems. So the main part is from five to 20 kilowatt peaks. So for our calculations, we had those boundary conditions. Uh, we said only roof area. We want only a roof area that has a solar irradiation of 950 kilowatt hours per square meter in the year. That means the energy that uh, like uh, from the sun that's gets to the roof per square meter is higher than 950 kilowatt hours. And then we only want to install on roof areas where we have more than 15 square meters of inclined area. So it would be not useful to put the PV panel on, on a park bench and then the next PV panel on the next park bench and then have to do the wiring all over the place. So we cho uh, choose uh, just bigger parts of a, um, uh, a roof to be feasible, economically feasible. Then we have an area utilization rate. So you have to think about, um, we need some space on the roof for maintenance and service. 
We have non-usable areas because of monument protection. We have chimneys, we have a strange roof geometry. Um, yes, that all reasons why we can't install PV uh, modules on there. So in the end, we have a maximum of 69% uh, of the roof area we have that we can use for PV installation. We selected here 50% to be like conservative. The installable PV power per area is about 200 watt peaks per square meter, but that's maybe too, too abstract of a number for most of you. Um, here we see the trend, where we, the trend where we have to go. So in blue, you can see the historical data. This thing we, we, we uh, have seen before. And red would be the path to go to reach our goals from Tyrol 2050. You can see in the bottom there this small rise and all the way we have to go. That's around 3.6 gigawatt peaks uh, from today, let's say. Um, what can we say about that? Yeah. If we assume a linear growth, that would be 128 megawatt peaks per year. And that's half of what we have installed right now. So every two years, we would have to install what we have right now. So that's also the reason why this is this, is this big part. Yes? Uh, the percentage of houses, uh, that's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure the percentage about the percentage of houses, but uh, if you take all the suitable roof area, uh, we selected here 50% of that. Uh -huh. So maybe you can like break that down to houses somewhere, or this may be also representable for number of houses. Yes, um, if we look at what this means every year, we have this fancy double graph overlap. <laughs> um, in, in the steepest area of this S-curve, we need to install around of uh, 280 to 290 megawatt peaks per year. And that's more than what we have installed today. And here in the colors, again, you see that most of the PV systems to be installed are fairly, have a fairly uh, low power output. So below 30 kilowatt peaks. Um, so why do you choose the S curve, not a line here? The reason for that is that with uh, such uh, groundbreaking technologies, you in the beginning, you have a, a fast adoption. So you, you could say you would pick the low hanging fruits. You have people that want PV, you have people that uh, uh, have a roof to work with and they quickly like start this exponential growth. But at some point um, it's harder to find roofs that have not been touched yet. And in the end, only a few roofs or people are left that want to install new PV systems. So this is the reason why it starts very quickly and then in the end, uh, like reaches a maximum. This you could say is the market saturation. And um, maybe you could argue, but why should we start a PV uh, company if we have this peak at 2032 and then it just drops off, then we have to fire all our people. That would be uh, not sufficient, uh, uh, not sustainable. Um, but what happens in the end of this decline is we have to then renew old parts of the PV systems. Okay, so maybe the panels uh, 
have a lifespan about 25 to 30 years. So if we start today, uh, we would need to renew panels maybe from the year 2045, okay? But we also have other components that have a shorter lifespan with, with PV systems. Uh, so you could say from 2040 on, you have to renew the old systems we have built in the, in the previous uh, uh, progress. Here again, the system sizes to install. We can see on the x-axis the power output of the different uh, systems. Uh, and on the left, the number of uh, systems to install on buildings. So there would be from zero to 10 kilowatt peaks would be over 90,000 uh, PV systems, which we have to somehow install on the Tyrolean roofs. Then how many people do we need uh, for all these PV installations? You need about uh, one person uh, that can do two PV systems uh, like together. And we have three people that uh, uh, install the PV system on the roof. And you need maybe some more days for bigger systems. But in the end, if we have people that only do PV installations um, all year long, we need about 40 planners and 700 installers. So pretty similar number with the heat pumps. <clears throat> What else uh, were the findings when talking about PV? So right now the PV electricity generation served about maybe today is it three or even more percent of the total en uh, electricity demand. So very little part of, of this, uh, but it's a rapidly growing market as we have seen in the recent history. Uh, we have a huge gap to close, uh, more than 10 X of what we currently installed have installed and in the stakeholder workshops um, we found out that we need way more pv planners and installers that's the bottleneck here we need more people to install uh, the systems and yeah mostly most of the uh, systems have a power output of below 30 kilowatt peaks but uh, Unfortunately, we have no PV panel uh, manufacturers in Tyrol. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. So a small company, probably not sufficient to produce all of those modules. So there we have an external bottleneck that could really get in our way in this case. And we have no influence on that, except we really try to push uh, uh, this industry. But I think that's uh, uh, quite hard to do because we have such cheap systems now from the rest of the world that it's not economically feasible for us to introduce this new market. Then we have a deployment structure. We've talked about all the people we need. And uh, then let's see how many we have. Here is a small overview of people who have something to do with heat pumps or PV installations. We have roofers and tinsmith that can like do the uh, uh, in installation of the panels, not the electrical work. Then we have gas, water, HVAC in in installation. Uh, we have around uh, 3,900 people which work in this uh, part of the construction industry. Then electrical installation, about the same. And in general, we have about 29,000 people working in the instruction, uh, construction industry. And uh, in the bottom, you see how this is split up. We have some workers, we have standard employees, we have apprentices. Uh, apprentices make like on average 
nine ten percent uh, and the workers make on average 60 percent of all the people who work in these categories so the estimation of the current personnel capacities uh, we took this data and we said 50 percent of the employees are planners and in this case we have with hvac so heating system installation 2,300 workers, 470 apprentices, 500 planners, with electrical a bit less, and with roofers and tinsmiths, uh, 1,600 workers, 70 apprentices, and so on. So, and now we have to compare this number with what we need uh, for the installations we talked about. So we said for the heat pump systems installations, we need about 600 people, uh, 600 workers, 35 planners. Looks like uh, we have enough people, but we heard that the uh, manufacturers said we had way too uh, less people. So what could be the reason for that? The reason for that is that those people mostly do other stuff than heat pump installations they have to fix old stuff redo the piping and many other things for example so this is the reason why it looks like we have enough people but we don't have enough because they have other stuff to do and uh, what we need here really is uh, additional training for existing workers that is also a crucial point if we if we install a new heat pump we want it to be installed correctly and efficient uh, and that it works efficiently because if something goes wrong then this this person tells it to the neighbor and this tells it to the other neighbor and then in the end everyone bashes heat pumps for no reason just because some installer did it wrong okay so for that reason we need additional training for the existing workers then electrical, uh, we need that for PV installations. Here, the same thing. Looks like we have enough, but they're mostly doing other stuff. Wiring in the, in, in the household, uh, other installations, and um, the PV installation part of their work is pretty small. So the same here, we need additional workers and planners for PV installations. And a help or some of the work uh, can be done by the roofers and tinsmiths. They can maybe do the state, uh, uh, statics, the mounting and other stuff. So just uh, the basic stuff where nothing dangerous can happen. And then the electrician comes and does the wiring. So everything works fine. So, uh, when we look at the, prog uh, the trend of new apprentices, so people who co come into the jobs that we just talked about right now, uh, we see that about 1% of all uh, peop uh, people people aged 15 to 19 are going in the uh, construction industry as apprentices. And luckily, Tyrol is uh, on the top here. This would be the, the black uh, line here. So um, in comparison to, for example, Vienna, uh, they have uh, really low numbers right there. Then the part-time quota, also a big problem. Uh, more and more people only want to work part-time or some sort of part-time so the the red line would be the part-time quota of women uh, blue line would be part-time quota of men and uh, the rest uh, part-time quota in general of all the people and we keep we can see that it is rising so we have a problem because of that already because uh, we would need more working hours but people want to work less in general. And the same thing you can see on the right, 
uh, standard working hours per week are also declining very slowly, but also declining. <clears throat> then we have a turning point in the labor market. Next problem. That's probably also the reason why there are pretty much no people in any industry. We uh, have two, uh, we're running out of people, so to say. <laughs> Uh, running out of people who are in the working age group. Um, on the left, you can see the apprentices um, by year in the construction industry. The orange bars would be how there, how many apprentices there are, about 400 per year. And uh, we can see the population of this age group, 15 to 19, who would be uh, doing these apprenticeships. Uh, are declining very rapidly. So in this case, the construction industry did the right thing, even though uh, the, the people got less, they still have uh, a constant number uh, of new apprenticeships. And on the right, we can see the forecasts of the working population until 2035, we see this hard decline in the working population. So that could also be a problem we face. We need more people, what we get is less people. Yes. Um, the lower number are 440,000 people and currently we have uh, 470,000. So maybe this uh, y-axis scaling is not that true, but I mean, you, you can see that the trend is going down and even uh, this number of 30,000 people that uh, is, are going to be missing in, I mean, it's just 10 years from now. Um, you have to somehow uh, like compensate that. Yes, then training and education, very important for the people uh, that work uh, in the construction, construction industry or want to work there. Um, responsible for good and future-proof training and education. Um, as I said before, we need future-proof training. What we have right now in most cases is that the people who want to work in the construction industry, for example, uh, HVAC installers, still learn to install oil heating systems. That's not necessary anymore. When they start to work, they're only confronted by new renewable heating systems. So uh, there has to be some sort of change in the uh, educational department. Um, what we can see here uh, are four categories. We have the vocational schools, uh, German Berufsschulen, um, we heard from our stakeholder workshops that the renewable energy is only taught to a very limited extent and uh, the principles would have influence on the teaching material. So they could change it to the new technologies. But currently that's not the case. And also there's the question, who can teach the new technology? There's also a lack of people who really know about this stuff. And then we have the VFI, uh, they do in-service training, further education. Um, here again, renewable energy is only 5% of the content that they learn. The rest is basics and fossil burners. <laughs> then we have technical high schools. Um, we have one technical high school who is really going towards the energy transition. And uh, they try to change uh, their content to the new technologies. Other technical high schools don't even have the names uh, renewable or photovoltaics in their curricula. So you can see uh, like this, this uh, gap here, what we should do and what we are doing. Then we have uh, college and university. We have the management center Innsbruck. They have uh, two bachelors uh, in the direction of sustainable technologies. Uh, then here at the University of Innsbruck, uh, we have the Master of Environmental Engineering and 
This is based on the bachelor's uh, construction and environmental engineering. And we also have the FH Kufstein. They have a bachelor and master in energy and sustainability management. Okay, so what are the recommended actions to increase the gaps uh, with the stakeholders and all the people involved? We worked out this uh, small overview here. Uh, we need mainly four different approaches. We have to make training and education better and suitable for the new technologies. Uh, we have to create low threshold offers for education. We have to change the teaching content in the schools. And we have to also do some name changes. Um, some subjects, for example, are still called gas uh, system installation. Although they maybe teach also other, other stuff, but that's just the name of it. So maybe we can do a bit of a name changing here. And also we need a higher qualification of auxiliary stuff um, just to improve the quality in, in general. Then we need the marketing strategy. We need to get pe people in the uh, construction industry. Um, maybe this could look like a initiative, like work for the energy transition, as you can see on the right top. Uh, we need a political promotion for green jobs. Um, raising awareness among building owners. So uh, show them that it can be also economically feasible to do a renovation, to do insulation, to replace the heating system. Then we can uh, leverage the labor market potential. We uh, could look at internal migration or migration in general. We could look at uh, uh, increasing the quota of women in, in the tech industry or general in the construction industry. Then we could do retraining people from un other industries coming to the construction industry and um, also do marketing uh, as we have on the right top. Uh, yeah, and show them testimonials, salaries that you can earn a good money with the, uh, those uh, those jobs. And last but not least, quality monitoring. Uh, that's very important. We have to do a quality check for heating installations. As I said before, if one installer messes up, he tells everyone around him and then everyone is scared to go towards the new technologies. And uh, for that reason, if someone comes to check your system, and he maybe tries to solve some complications, problems that you have, and then it's working all fine, then everyone is happy. And maybe then this person tells the neighbors, oh, you have to try that also. The heat pump works great or the PV system works great, whatever. Uh, also, this uh, is kind of a part of the first point, busting myths. So there are a lot of myths about uh, new technologies. I mean, for example, uh, yeah, when, when it's too cold outside, the heat pumps don't heat the house anymore. That's a myth that exists. And um, those myths should be busted so that people are not scared to go into new technologies. And this should be for professions, also for the jobs in the construction engineer, uh, uh, construction industry. Um, they have all, um, um, there is still this uh, old picture of a like strong man uh, that's on the construction side, but that could be changed. Uh, maybe also uh, that there are more women now on construction sites. So that would be also a myth about the professions and, as I said, the technologies. So open questions to answer. Uh, what we did not look at was the cost of action and most importantly, the cost of inaction. That would be very important to look at here. Uh, how much would it cost 
if we do all this stuff we suggested and how much is the damage that we have afterwards if we don't do anything then how could you increase work performance we have a lack of people maybe we can help them with new technological developments to increase the work performance install more heating systems with less people maybe give a product uh, to them that's all ready and you just have to install it very quickly then the ai and automation changes the labor market we have more people who need to switch jobs or industries maybe also you could say automation and ai could solve some problems within this industry but since it's a really hands-on job uh, that takes i think a bit more time and have schools and further education change since the energy cost crisis uh, this data we used and also the stakeholder uh, workshops we had are already uh, two years uh, one to two years ago so uh, you could see have they now changed since heat pumps and pv systems are now in the media that would be something uh, to investigate okay that's it thank you very much and i'm happy to answer some questions now yes uh, sorry the the previous slide yes mm -hmm. okay <laughs> yeah simon thank you very much for the presentation um yeah now we can just start the q a session so if you in the audience have some questions um i'll hand out the mic um that all the remote people can hear you and on the other side if you've um, our online guest then please um, type in the chat up to now we don't have any question in the chat but if you have some question just type in and then i'll repeat the question and uh, simon will answer the question so is some question in the audience um, do you have any any questions that's your future. That's the work of the future in the next uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So do you have any, any questions about it? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope I remember it right, but I think there was a diagram about heating wood still in 2050 with a quite high percentage. I was wondering because it's not CO2 neutral, why it's still rising or not. Um, yeah. Um, so, in general, the accounting with wood is uh, that you take the CO2 that's generated uh, that's generated when you burn it, mm -hmm. and then you subtract the CO2 that's uh, extracted from the air when the tree grew. So, in this case, you could argue uh, a burning wood is always uh, neutral the problem yes you're right <laughs> uh, that's not really true uh, there are some studies on that uh, exactly um, th the thing is uh, where do you draw the line here so what is the time frame that you look at uh, how much time does a new tree take to grow for example or uh, how many uh, how much of the other stuff do you take out of the forest in order to get to the wood and uh, yeah maybe I, I don't know do you have more information on that topic so i'm, I'm also no no expert uh -huh. for that topic but i guess there are also other greenhouse gases like methane and so on mm -hmm. coming out and are emitted by burning it so yeah yeah so you could argue it's climate neutral but uh, in reality is it is probably not very uh, completely sorry i think part of the answer is um, that the wood mentioned here is not uh, fresh uh, cellulose from from the forest it's uh, rest uh, stuff of uh, biomass so um like wood waste or um uh, degraded parts of wood so 
um, you are totally right that first priority should be to use um, wood for building, for construction, for insulation, for cellulose and so on. Um, and only rest um, parts of what should be burned. So it should be reduced in future, I think uh, it's perfectly right. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Um, before that, we had the, the numbers for the district heating. Okay. And I was wondering what's the, what's the primary energy source be behind the district heating? Mm -hmm. uh, so the assumption was that, uh, sorry, where is it? Du -du 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 -du. The primary, uh, primary energy uh, source of the district heating sh should be as well renewable. Uh, so it would not make sense to rate it as renewable and then in the end uh, have a gas burner uh, running in the background. Um, I'm not sure uh, how this is split up. Maybe in the future there are heat pumps running in the background or biomass is, I think, also uh, part of the many district heating systems. Um, yeah, that's, I think, the two main energy sources for the future district heating system. Yeah, plus waste heat and waste heat, um, yes. uh -huh. yeah, heat from industry um, feed into the grid. Yeah. Uh, that's the, but you're totally right. That uh, should be also uh, CO2 free. And the question, what is waste heat? So um, uh, it should be from um, industry which can't use it internally. Uh, so only this heat, um, which is really not usable in-house, should be feed to the grid. And the uh, energy for the industry should also be renewable. So that's a long, long chain uh, to, to have a completely uh, renewable uh, grid. Um, and that's always the discussion at the moment. The, um, for example, in Vienna, um, they yeah, um, always talk about making it more and more renewable, but uh, it's not at the moment, it's not. Uh, um, that's a uh, task for the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, good that you mentioned that uh, because, as you said before, uh, you just say we do all district heating and then <laughs> we're done with all the calculations. But uh, what lays behind, I mean, in the end, it doesn't matter too much where the energy is uh, produced uh, or, or not produced, but the energy is like uh, collected uh, in the in, with the district heating, you have a centralized heating system, and with the standard heating, you have it in a decentralized. So it's a difference. Um, and as you said, that's right, uh, this should also be renewable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, first, like in addition to that, I was wondering because. I mean, there's new technologies coming up with the CCS, the carbon capture storage and stuff. So this could be kind of a way to make it carbon neutral if you have centralized district heating. Um, but anyways, I was um, I had another question popping up. Yeah, the cost of inaction, how would you calculate that? Um, the cost of inaction, uh, like in the first place, would be the higher energy cost uh, when you do not have uh, uh, insulation or a more efficient heating system. You have higher energy costs, but on the long run, uh, it's the climate damage we have to face. So that would be the inaction also people who have uh, uh, that have to move because of climate action that's all like coming together that's the cost of inaction that's what, what we have to pay for in the future um yeah mostly that so like are there any like besides for example the the emissions handle the co2 prices or anything are there any other and and what you said like the normal like the price for for kilowatt hours or whatever. Is there any other measuring tool? 
like if you said that people have to move away and or the like you cannot grow that many crops anymore or like whatever is there any any number or any indicator where you can measure that and put that in to... I mean, uh, I mean, one quick example is always the the money that's one that's the easiest part uh, if you just uh, forecast that there are more, uh, a more uh, like heavy weather, uh, like hail or or more storms or heavier winds, uh, and you could calculate the damage from that. Um, if you talk about uh, migration or uh, that people have to move because of the climate change. Um, that's where it gets difficult. Maybe you could uh, look at what you have to rebuild um, to house them and to feed them. That could be an approach there. So, but yes, that's uh, not an easy calculation. <laughs> that's thank probably you. also because uh, the reason why no one does it. <laughs> okay, thank you. There are two big problems in um, um, putting these damages into numbers. Um, one is, as uh, Simon said, it's difficult to estimate. It's some prognosis and um, it's not completely uh, well defined. It's some prognosis. And he has a problem, and that's the problem of our economics. Um, most of the uh, damages will happen in the far future. Okay, we already have some damages now, and they are severe, they are horrible, yeah, already. But the more uh, horrible scenario will come in 100 years. And now, if you um, uh, valorize um, these damages on the present value, um, you have to reduce the price for the damages in the future uh, to now. And um, that's uh, if you do it with the um, uh, standard um, procedure of economics of today, the value of the damages in 100 years are almost zero. They are so small, uh, it's behind the, the comma. Um, so, but that's our future, and our children will have this damage in full value. They will have all these damages, um, but the economic uh, procedure of um, how do you call it, down, downscaling or down rating um, to the present value now, uh, comes out it's um, almost zero. These are the two, two problems. Yeah? Uh, but in fact, you can somehow valorize also damages. And one good indicator is um, the insurances. Already now the insurances uh, rise because the damages are rising and the and the chance that some damage by storms, thunderstorms, or flooding, or whatever, will happen is already rising, and uh, the insurances are going up. And this can be also um, economically, um, yeah, priced in, um, and and the CO2 pricing. That's a um, already rising number, too small at the moment, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's rising. Yeah, other. Questions? Um, I look in the audience, there's no. Um, one question from my side about um, uh, the um, labor necessary for this um, future. Um, you um, showed all the labors necessary for PV, for renovations. Um, this is building related work, but Building PV is not all. <laughs> um, you also need some storages and some um, backup systems. Um, if we have um, a cold winter, a dark winter, it's always dark, <laughs> there's not um, much uh, PV in winter, and um, just assume there is no uh, wind. Um, so we have less wind power, then we need some backup, we need some storage. And um, this has also be built and we need labor for it. We need uh, people doing this uh, um, additional electricity grid, the storages and all this. That's not included or is it uh, also? Uh, no, that's not included in this case. Uh, I know there are numbers uh, how much storage is needed, but uh, I think uh, the market is moving so rapidly right now with uh, storage technologies. Uh, the price is declining very fast. so. Uh, 
no, we have not done the calculations, but that would be possible as well, yes. This is comes additionally for the yeah. uh, okay. addition, yes. But mm -hmm. but also in, in the building itself, maybe the production is a, a more of a problem, but um, if you place a, a ready storage inside your house, I think that's not too much of an extra effort if you install a PV system. Oh, and no, I don't uh, speak about the short-term storages, which could be a battery or ah, what, but, uh, on the seasonal storage. And that's outside, that's uh, um, uh, PV methane, uh, gas storage, seasonal storage is much more expensive yeah, and much yeah, bigger. Yeah. That's not in, in the house. That's only a short-term storage. But that's all also has to be built in that you need labor for it. Yeah. yeah. And as a question about the heat pumps, you showed that the number of heat pumps, ground source heat pumps is reduced uh, and the uh, air to air uh, heat pumps are rising. Um, uh, this is the market at the moment, but in future we also need ground heat pumps. If you um, talk about cities um, in the old town of Innsbruck, for example, uh, you can't uh, install hundreds of uh, air to air heat pumps. Maybe therefore we need some additional ground source heat pump and that's a special technology and there we need uh, again special planners and special installers and special machines Perfect, and so, yes. uh, so is, is this also um, in the labor calculation uh, included or is it uh, based on, on um, air to air heat pumps? Uh, this is based on like the average that it takes for all heat pumps installed. Mm -hmm. Uh, the stakeholders had uh, some some numbers like experience uh, values that they have, so it's a bandwidth. Of course, this is more of a challenge, and uh, you need more work hours. But maybe there are some cases where, for the air to water heat pumps, you need even less work hours. So uh, I think this is like uh, included. Also, if you, I mean, if you see the current trend. Uh, the part of the ground source heat pumps and, and uh, groundwater heat pumps are small. Uh, that would have to change uh, pretty quickly in this case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, for the ground heat pump, um, I was just wondering why it's such a low number, because I know that the regulatory right now, uh, the law doesn't really allow to dig deep underground and uh, get the, the heat from the ground. If it's like deep down there and you have to, to, um, to drill a hole like vertical and then horizontally, like I know that the law doesn't allow this right now, but I know that they're changing it in the next years so i think like that could lead to a huge difference right because when you think about i mean i don't have any current numbers but the thing that was happening in vienna when they discovered this huge groundwater resource that where you could get your heat heating from and stuff like this like the only thing that or like one of the main reasons why these projects are not as progressed is because of the law situation as far as i know by now so um, this I don't is know, maybe uh, it's like do you have any more information on that or uh yes uh, if you if you dig deep then you have to get the permit if you want to uh, pump uh, groundwater you have you, you need a permit um for uh like the when you when you dig not too deep like you have also the horizontal ground source i i don't think you need a permit there but i'm not quite sure um yes that's true that probably will change uh, or already uh, change but the problem uh, as well is the cost uh, digging is always expensive uh, i've just heard uh, a number uh, a few days ago for one borehole uh, 100 meters deep, it's already more than the cost of a complete air to water heat pump. So just the borehole is, is very expensive. And uh, the efficiency you gain with such systems 
is often not too different to air to water heat pumps. So you would invest uh, a lot of money in the borehole, for example, or in the pumping, uh, and the return is not too big in comparison to air to water heat pumps. That's, I think, the main reason why this uh, the share of the air to water heat pumps is so high right now. It's it's easier to install. Uh, it works uh, in more places and uh, it's cheaper. That's true for single family homes and uh, the costs are for the company on driving to the building site, drilling and uh, drive home. Um, but if you have a, um, a centralized uh, system for a city, for example, you can drill many holes uh, on one day and then you have the driving hours or less. Uh, so I think in future for the centralized systems, it could be more feasible, but you're right for the, for the uh, single family homes. It's just as you mentioned. Yeah. Just, uh, uh, mm. It's because uh, single family and small multifamily homes are most of the buildings we have. So that's, that's the reason why also this uh, share is so high. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's some uh, comment from uh, the um, uh, online uh, participants um, on our discussion before about uh, how to price tag the damages. Um, it's super difficult um, to put a price tag on the damage climate change is doing. Maybe a notable attempt would be um, um, by the German Umweltbundesamt. They say it's 180 euros per ton of CO2. For Austria, this would be a um, certain billion euro per year. And there is some um, in this, uh, this is of course a very rough estimate and there is a, a link from Umweltbundesamt and um, I can copy the link for the others if you're interested in. Thank you for the, for the comment, thank you. Maybe I add something here. Uh, uh, it's, it's nice to have this number, uh, but you also have to come up with the number. So. Uh, yes, of course, you can. You could calculate it with that, um, but I guess there are many sources who have all sorts of orders of magnitude. Uh, it depends on where you draw the line, what you include, what you don't include. So yes, would be an approach. Just simply look at the CO2, uh, multiply it by 180 euros, and then we have it. But uh, yeah. I think the factor is uh, you could you could have a factor of uh, 10 uh, 10 x more or 10 x less in this case. Or if you think about energy efficiency, um, then you can um, avoid CO2 by saving energy. And the interesting thing is the price of the avoided CO2 emissions by reduction of energy by efficiency is negative. You gain money by saving energy. So the price is negative, it's a profit. And that's fantastic because that what uh, Simon mentioned here is renovation of buildings plus renewables. And all this renovation um, is a reduction of energy, a reduction of emissions, and you reduce the price. You, you pay less for heating, you pay less for cooling, you save money and the CO2 uh, avoidance is negative. So, okay, you have some investment, but um, including the investment and in the uh, payback, um, it's a negative energy price, uh, CO2 price uh, for avoidance. And that's really fantastic. And that's a low hanging fruits, just do it do the uh, reduction of emissions by efficiency. That's, uh, that's uh, the message here. Okay, any other questions? There's no in the, in the chat, so it doesn't, seems like. Okay, then I will say thank you very much. Thank you for uh, our presentation and thank you for the audience thank for the for yes. discussions. Thank you. Thank you.